One more time. John chapter six, verse 35. Let us pay heed to this inerrant and fallible holy word of God given to us for our instruction and salvation and righteousness. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that came down from, that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not as the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Now turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Again, let us pay heed to this word. This is Paul writing, saying, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Thus for the reading of the word of God, let us pray. Father, we come to hear you speak. We come to learn of this new covenant in your blood. Help us to discern the body this morning. Help us to grow in our understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning we have the opportunity to review, to some degree, what we have discussed before, and then spend some time discussing what qualifies us to come to the Lord's table that he has prepared for us, that the Lord Jesus has told us, as we read, that if we do not eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of the blood, there is no life in us. And so a few weeks ago now, we discussed the importance of understanding this meal as a means of grace, of how we spiritually find nourishment and grace in partaking, participating, if you will, in the sacrifice of Christ as we take the bread and the wine. We embrace with a believing heart all the sufferings and death of Christ as if they were our own, for in union with Christ they were for us. And as branches grafted into the true vine, we humbly receive the glorious work that Christ has done for us by his body and his blood. And we receive and confess the work that the Holy Spirit has done and continues to do as he dwells in Christ now and in us as well and imparts to us, grows us in grace, grows us in, tr in the truth of such a great salvation that was made effectual by the work of our Lord in his condescension, in his life, in his suffering, in his death upon the cross, in his resurrection as a promise for his people. The next, next message on the Lord's Supper, we focused on what I would call the, the biblical theological meaning of this meal and how even from Genesis and the, the clothing of Adam and Eve after they had fallen in that first sin of Adam, the Lord has presented to the world, specifically to his people, salvation by means of a body broken, by means of blood shed, by means of a covering made for the sin of his people. And we looked at that through Genesis 3, through the Passover at the time of Moses, and then, of course, finally, once for all in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, upon the cross. And we stated that what we mean by this service of the Lord's Supper is that we are, as we read again today, that we are declaring the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ until he comes. But in declaring that death, we're not just declaring that he died, we're also declaring the covenant promises that come with that death, that our sins are, are, are covered and they're forgiven in his suffering and in his death because I am his and he is mine. This is not just some general meal for, for the world, but Jesus offers this meal to his elect. He invites us, his people, to partake and participate as this means of grace that strengthens it strengthens our understanding. It strengthens our reception of the truth of what God has done for us. And what we mean by the service when we partake of the bread and wine is that our Lord's body was broken and his blood was shed for me. And my sins are covered. And not only mine, but all those that are partaking with me in this room this morning, in this meal, we are one. We are his. And what a glorious God we have in allowing us to participate in such a meal. And I've thought about this message over the past two weeks as I've had the opportunity. And I thought that much of this morning's message really does boil down to, if I can say it that way, to whether we understand this truth about the body and the blood that, that God created us in his image, that he breathed life into us. He tells us 
that life is in the blood. He gave us these bodies so that we could go and live, live out the implications, the commands of being made in his image. And having fallen now, as we are all fallen, bodies have to be broken. Blood has to be shed. A new covering given where we cannot be saved. And this is all provided in Christ, in his body, and his blood, and his covering. And in his once for all time sacrifice, and that's going to come to be important. We have this truth signed and sealed in the Lord's Supper. I will mention this again, or these three things again at the end, but to take the Lord's Supper worthily, which is what we're really speaking of mostly this morning. I'll go ahead and tell you, it means that we have to ask ourselves, do we understand our sin? Do we truly understand our sin? Do we understand who our Savior is and what he has done? And then do we take this supper with the full spiritual intent to live in obedience as the Lord has commanded in his great commission? As he said, go forth and make disciples and baptize and teach them, not just teach them the commands, but teach them to obey all that he has commanded. And so this morning, again, this the first point we must cover that we'll be discussing, uh, something is something of what is declared in the Lord's Supper. What do we mean by the Lord's Supper and what do we mean differently than what Rome means by the Lord's Supper? And then the second point is how understanding the truth behind what we are doing in the Lord's Supper, what we are declaring, qualifies us to partake in this meal. Some of what we're going to say here in the first half, again, might seem a bit repetitious, but that's always necessary for um, us fallen individuals. And actually, this 80th question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism that we read is actually an addition to the Catechism. Um, one of the, the German rulers, I, I believe Fr Frederick III, I think had the Heidelberg Catechism kind of drawn up in the first place, but he ordered this additional question 80 to be added because he did not feel that question and answer 78 was strong enough in renouncing the Roman Catholic Mass and what the Mass was meant to represent. And that's why I held off a little bit a couple of weeks ago. We'll look at it more closely today. If you look again to about halfway down the answer to question 80, you find that the catechism tells us that the Roman Catholic Church teaches, taught or teaches, they both are true, that in the mass, the pardon of sins was not completed at the cross, but that Christ must continue to be sacrificed in the form of the bread and the wine. And so additionally to that as well, because he is being, the bread and wine literally is becoming our Lord. Additionally, the bread and wine then is to be worshiped. It is to be worshiped because in the Roman Catholic teaching, again, it's not just that Christ is present with us. It's that that is him in the bread and the wine. So they worship the bread and the wine. You need to understand that this is true of the Roman Catholic Church. It may not come across in every congregation, but it is the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. At the Council of Trent in the 1500s, 1545 to 1563, the Roman Catholic Church declared, and I quote, the sacrifice, this is not a quote, note that they call it a sacrifice. Back to the quote, the sacrifice of the mass is propitiatory both for the living and the dead. And for as much as in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the mass, that same Christ is contained 
and immolated in an unbloody manner on the altar of the cross, the Holy Synod teaches that this sacrifice is truly propitiatory and that by means thereof this is effected that we obtain mercy. Christ is contained and immolated in the body and blood on the cross. I brought another book. I don't know how much I'm going to read. There's a lot to be read. But the 17th article of Trent, of the Creed, and I'll read some. They taught, I do likewise profess that in the Mass is offered a true, proper, and propitiatory sacrifice for the living and the dead, and that the body and blood together with the soul and divinity, divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ are truly, really, and substantially in the most holy sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and that the whole substance of the bread is turned into the body, and the whole substance of the wine is turned into the blood, which change the Catholic Church calls transubstantiation. The Council of Trent went further. I have a long list. I'll read a few. And they say, if, if, if anyone denies that there is contained in the most holy sacrament of the altar, truly, really, and substantially, the body and the blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the entire Christ. If anyone say that he is contained therein only in a symbol of figure or figure or virtue, grace, let him be accursed. If anyone says that there remains in the most holy sacrament of the altar the substance of the bread and wine together with the life and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if he denies what wonderful and miraculous transformation of the whole substance of the bread into the body and the whole substance of the wine into the blood, while there remains only the form of the bread and wine, which transformation is termed by the Catholic Church, transubstantiation, let him be accursed. I'm going to stop there. There's many more. You can borrow the book later if you would like. But it just wasn't then either. The Baltimore Catechism, which is or was, it was first printed in 1885. It was the, 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 the staple catechism of the Roman Catholic Church from 1885 until the early 2000s. Um, they write, the Mass is the same sacrifice as the sacrifice on the cross. That same sentence, I believe that exact same phrase is still used in the, uh, the United States Catholic Catechism, which was first printed in 2004 and is replacing um, the Baltimore Catechism. But the truth that I'm trying to reveal here the Roman Catholic Church teaches that they are truly offering up Christ's body and blood again for immolation, for destruction. The Roman Catholic Church in their mass rejects scripture, rejects Hebrews chapter 10 verses 12 and 13, where God's holy word states that when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool. For by a single offering, this is continuing in Hebrews 10, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And then verse 18 of that chapter, if you wanted to go on, it says, where there is forgiveness of these sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. It was done, it was finished. It was completed in Christ once for all. There are many issues with the Mass. We could talk about this singularly the whole time, not just the fact that they believe that the bread and wine substantially become the body and blood, or that they declare that faith is not even necessary to receive grace from taking the Lord's Supper. We've discussed this. It operates ex opere operato, simply in taking the elements, you will receive grace, whether you have faith or not. Again, I think that goes completely against 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which we just read. But for our purposes this morning, let us simply state that we reject 
based upon Hebrews chapter 10 alone, but also with the the witness of the rest of God's word and his spirit, that our Lord himself, as declared in scripture, offered himself up once for all. He sits at the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning. His body is literally at the right hand of God the Father, whatever and wherever that actually might mean beyond our comprehension. But we believe that Jesus is literally in his new body, in a place that is called at the Father's right hand. He does not, uh, nor does he need to come down and be re-sacrificed over and over again. His death was sufficient. Our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the covenant for his people and his holy blood was sufficient for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. And it was efficacious for the forgiveness of the sins of his people. And also a point I left out earlier that's in your, um, I think it's in part of the answer there. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that those elements of bread and wine Once the priest declares, and I mentioned this, I think, a couple of weeks ago, the priest stands before the the people and says, hoc est corpus meum. He says those words over the bread and the wine, and then that's when they literally become the body and blood to the Roman Catholic Church. So those elements then are to be worshipped then and there, because for them that is the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the Roman Catholic Church, according to their teaching, like some, honestly, some sort of witchcraft, a man says a phrase in Latin, and we are then supposed to worship idols of bread and wine like they are God. That is why it calls it, and I want to get it right, accursed idolatry. The catechism calls it a cursed idolatry. And so I hope you understand. I, many people in the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't even understand this themselves. But this is why Protestant and Roman Catholic churches cannot find common ground when the truth of what they teach is truly examined and exposed for what they mean behind the re-sacrificing of Christ in their mass, but in the positive. In the positive, we have the first half of the answer to question 80 in the message from our previous weeks. The Lord's Supper does testify to us, for us, his people. Not that he needs to be re-sacrificed, but he has been sacrificed and we have a full pardon of all of our sins by the one, it's our, our catechism says, by the only or many one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself once accomplished on the cross and that we by the Holy Spirit are engrafted into Christ and we cannot be unengrafted, who with his true body, his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father And he is to be worshipped there. It says he will be worshipped there by us. The Lord's Supper, as instituted by Jesus the night he was betrayed, is never described as a sacrifice. It is given to us as a remembrance, as our God often tells us in Scripture many times and many for many things. Remember, you dull-hearted people, remember. And Jesus gave our dull minds and memories and senses this sensory sign and seal of the Lord's Supper so that we might understand more intimately our union with him through his once for all sacrifice. He sits at the right hand of the Father and is present with us spiritually as the Holy Spirit nourishes us and as our Lord himself awaits to take this meal again with all of his people in eternity. If you understand this, you have begun to understand what it means to take this meal worthily, which is our second focus 
1 Corinthians, again, chapter 11, verses 27 through 29, specifically gives the warning that no one is to partake of this meal in an unworthy manner, for they will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. This is not talking about whether you will ever be worthy enough to take this meal, for you won't. This is talking about you taking it in a worthily fashion. As we look at these verses, uh, 27 through 29 and 1 Corinthians 11, we see that the comparison is that someone who takes of the meal unworthily is someone who is not eating and drinking with the discernment with which this sacrament needs because we are spiritually feeding upon Christ. I know the language that we are spiritually feeding upon Christ can sound odd to some, to, to some modern ears, often because of the evangelical and fundamentalist circles that we come from or that we grew up in. But I simply point us back to John chapter six, which is why I read it again this morning. The language used in John six, the truth that he tells us that we must feed upon him. The nourishment is, of course, spiritual and not physical. But Jesus knew from eternity what he was coming to do and what he was coming to institute. He was not coming to institute a re-sacrificing of himself. That again would actually be profaning the true body and blood of the Lord as it makes an idol of the bread and the wine every mass. But with the words that Christ gave us, that he gave the apostles as he instituted this meal tied to the elements, we understand and we grow as we understand what he wants us to understand, that he is present, encouraging us, feeding us. We are further sanctified and conformed in his likeness, understanding his body broken, his blood shed and that we are covered. To reject that Christ wants us to understand that we truly receive nourishment in this sacrifice, his body and blood in this meal, to not let the body and blood have the sacramental meaning that God instructs is to take the meal unworthily and again to profane the body and blood of the Lord because we we take it not believing that Christ is truly at work sacramentally in the meal. But we have further instruction from the Heidelberg Catechism as well that's beneficial. It almost seems too obvious to state, but there's nothing too obvious now in the world that we live in when we don't know the difference between men and women. The first obvious statement is that the Lord's Supper is for believers. It is for believers. That shouldn't have to be argued, so I won't argue it much. But it is for those that have repented and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of their sins. It is for those that have entered into covenant with God, even falsely, possibly, as we find in the case of Judas, but we are told there is to be discernment. That's why the warning is given. Even in Judas' case, there's an argument as to whether Judas was present for that final Passover meal that became the Lord's Supper. But there was even a warning given then. In Judas' case, Jesus declared at that meal that the one that would betray him was sitting at the table and woe to him that was going to betray him. There was a warning there which is basically, I wouldn't take this meal if I were you. In answer 81, we find not only some basic qualification for those that the Lord's Supper are for, but we really could say that the statements in the answer of 81 are what it means to be a Christian, for it's a Christian that is to take the meal. The question in our catechism is for whom is the Lord's Supper instituted. There's a more modern translation that asks the question this way. 
who are to come to the table of the Lord. And I like that better, especially for us this morning. Who are to come to the table of the Lord? I want you to think of these phrases in that manner. Which of you in this room this morning, right now, are to come to the table of the Lord? Those of you that are truly sorrowful for your sins, and yet you trust that they are forgiven you for the sake of Christ. You should come to the table. Which of you in this room should come to the table of the Lord? Those of you that understand that your remaining infirmities, your remaining sins are also covered by Christ's suffering and death. You should come to the table of the Lord if you earnestly desire to have your faith more and more strengthened and your lives more holy. Examine yourself. Are you a believer? Can you answer yes to these questions? We can't answer these questions for you. If you can answer yes, this meal is for you. But hypocrites... Again, this is found in the catechism. Hypocrites, those of you pretending to be something you are not, those of you that act loving and forgiving on the outside but are not uh, truly repentant and you hold grudges and hatreds in your heart for others, even possibly for others in this room right now, you should not come to this table. You have not turned to God with a sincere heart. You would profane this meal because you lie to your brothers and sisters in Christ. This meal is more than a remembrance. That's why there's a warning. This meal is embracing that we are going to love one another as Christ has loved us. This is the greatest love there is in this meal that he laid down his life for his friends. Don't lie. Don't come to the table lying to yourself or lying to others. If you are not sincere in your repentance, you eat and drink judgment unto yourself. And so question 82. Again, all of this centering around 1 Corinthians 11 gives us the instruction that anyone who would declare themselves to not be a believer, obviously should not be admitted to the table. This is a turn though. They should not be admitted to the table. This means that the church, and we see here by the keys of the kingdom, which we'll come to this afternoon, the church by the keys of the kingdom are to keep unbelievers from coming to the table. It's not their option. We are to keep them from coming to the table. But in addition, it also says elders are to keep those from the table that by their life are showing themselves to be unbelievers or ungodly by their life. Will Helmus Shortinghouse, I think I've mentioned his name before. He was a Dutchman from the second Dutch Reformation, which was the first 50 years of the 17th or the 18th century, the 1700s. He has a list and I wanted to use it I'm going to mention a few. It's a, it's, a, it's a list for those who are unworthy partakers so that we can examine ourselves. First, again, we can say unbelievers, which I pray in mean, more and more churches will become obvious that unbelievers should not be participating in the Lord's table. But then it's, he says the ignorant, the ignorant, which means those that simply do not understand what the supper means. It doesn't have to be negative about them. They just need to learn. They need, we need to teach them what the supper means so that they can take it worthily. But then we get into those that will take a little bit more diligence to discern. We will use the word of God in guarding the table. But elders also must keep some from coming. Hypocrites. Hypocrites we are to keep from the table. Then those who are religious only externally, which sounds like a hypocrite, but sometimes the hypocrite's not even religious, but they're merely spiritual. 
So the hypocrite, the religious only externally, then those who do not show any experiential working regarding Christ. Again, there's no good work. There's no fruit in their life. They say they are a believer, but then there's nothing. Possibly some of those that never attend church unless it's time to take the Lord's Supper. And then finally, those who are not united in heart and walk with God's people. Simply meaning, again, those that aren't members of a local congregation or that are, but the congregation allows someone to never come to church and keep their membership. Or even those that come to church on a regular basis, but everyone knows they're not truly united to the people in that building. They haven't, they, they, they say they've come into union with Christ, but they haven't come into union with the people in that church. And how will they know that we are believers? By our love for one another. Can I say that if we instituted this type of list today in, in many churches, I'm not saying ours, but in many churches, and the elders actually did their jobs, there would be a war in many churches at the, at the attempt to remove people from their churches. And so you're to examine yourselves. This is where the questions come back again that I think have been underneath everything we've said. If you're going to come worthily to the table, first, do you recognize that you are a sinner and do you have godly sorrow for that sin? Secondly, are you trusting in the once for all sacrifice of Christ, in Christ alone, his broken body, his shed blood, his covering of righteousness for the gift, for the forgiveness of your sin, past, present, and future. And then third, do you not only understand Jesus as your savior, but do you understand him as your Lord so that you sincerely desire to be holy as he is holy? And so you believe that in this meal, you are receiving nourishment to your soul to be strengthened in your faith, to walk, to walk in holiness. Do not come to the table wanting to be seen by others. as taking the Lord's table, to be seen by others as something you are not. If you cannot answer yes to these questions, do not compound your troubles with eating and drinking further judgment upon yourself. And pray. Pray for your elders. We'll talk more, a little bit more about this this evening. For you see in the answer 82, the, the question and answer 82, it's not just your individual judgment that is focused here. And this should make us concerned for many congregations. It should make us see why judgment's already begun in the house of the Lord. If elders allow those that are unbelievers or those that are living in unbelief or in an ungodly fashion to take the Lord's Supper, those elders are allowing the covenant of God to be profaned and they're asking for God's wrath. It says God's wrath is provoked against that whole congregation as it was in Israel with her and her watchmen. So it is with the church today. And how many churches are actually guarding the table or even understand what is happening when we sit down to remember what our Lord has done? 1 Corinthians 11 verses 30 through 32 instruct the church that many are weak and sick and many sleep because we are not judging ourselves. That's what it's saying. Look at the phrases, read it again. We, we, are, we are weak and sick and many asleep because we're not judging ourselves. 1 Corinthians 5 and 11 here tells us we are to judge ourselves so that God does not judge us. The warning from Psalm verses 50, verse 16, God says to the wicked, 
And hear these words, God says to the wicked, what right do you have to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. How much difference is there between the church and the wicked? If we're not guarding this holy table that God has instituted. Titus chapter three, verses 10 and 11. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse six. We command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Friends, there are not many that can stand to hear these words of God that I just read to you. If I said them to someone and didn't tell them they were from the Bible, even if I did, they might just say I'm being judgmental or legalist. But these are our commands. These are commands given to God's people. Why? Because God is holy. He's holy. And this meal is holy. It's sacred. By the application of the Holy Spirit, of the words of institution to the elements that Jesus himself gave us. This meal is holy and it's serious. Baptism and the Lord's Supper both mean more than just some memory of something that God did a long time ago. These are signs and seals of what God continues to do, what he's, what he's doing now and what he will continue to do. And if we are going to partake worthily, we need to get more serious and sincere and reverent about the means of grace our Lord Jesus Christ has given us. If you are in Christ, you are forgiven of your sins by the body and blood of Christ. You are covered past, present, and future by the person and work of Jesus Partake worthily in this meal. God instituted it for you, for his glory, for your strength and encouragement and growth. Partake seriously, partake joyfully, and partake worthily because you understand what our great Savior has done for us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly